I must confess that the Hindi heartland of India is completely enamored and captivated by this Hindutva agenda. The Hindi Hindutva agenda in the Hindi heartland is working. Their agenda is that India must be an Hindu Iran. See, you're do you have a narrative? Do you have a plan in place to stop the BJP? <coughs> See, I am not. This is this is a question way beyond my pay grade. Mm -hmm. You have to understand be very very clearly. I can confidently tell you the India Alliance is going to sweep Tamil Nadu. Being a, a, a non-Hindi speaking South Indian politician, I am also not able to imagine what we should be saying or what is. I don't really have a concrete idea. There is no more cabinet system in India. It is a presidential form of government where the PMO runs the government country with diktats and everybody else endorses it because they are constitutionally mandated to endorse it. That is all has happened. My assessment is that there is a grave inferiority complex for the BJP, in spite of the fact that they have this great majority. They are afraid to let the opposition speak. So what if we speak? You can vote us out. At a very personal level, what have these cases done to you as a politician, as a person? See, personally what it has done to me is that it's, it has uh, made people wary of doing business with me. Why would anybody want to do business with me? Because if the minute you do business with me, any transaction with me by this wide interpretation of the PMLA can be termed as a proceeds of crime. They have taken away my computers thrice. So I have stopped buying computers. Because it makes no purpose. I do not know when they are going to come back. Again, they will take away the computer. They will only wrap it up in a gunny bag and it will lie in some ED office somewhere. But one one charge that the opposition makes time and again is that, uh, you know, the union government is using ED to poach uh, MPs, MLAs or to, you know, try and, uh, you know, poach politicians from one side to another. What happened in your case? Were you pressurized to join no, the BJP? I, see, I think or like, or see, everybody any... knows what I stand for. I mean, I don't think any, I mean, the BJP will be most uncomfortable with a person like me. <laughs> and I will be most uncomfortable with the BJP. So what happens in the custodial interrogation? Nothing. Actually, then, nothing. Actually, I have you, been, you have you have been there several several times. I have in fact I have been saying that they must record it and live telecast it. They must live telecast my interrogation. <laughs> so I have been asking for this. I even told the court, please live telecast. You will un understand the absurdity of these exercises. In my entire uh, time with the CBI of eleven days, I would have uh, totally uh, my entire questioning would have taken place for about four hours. Rest of the hours, I, I was just waiting. That's all, nothing Waiting else. where? So these are reasons why I think that NEET as, as it stands today has no role in Tamil Nadu. But we need to build a national consensus. And I think the Chief Minister made a good attempt in writing to the Chief Ministers. But I think the next step in my opinion should be the Chief Minister must call for a meeting of Chief Ministers or Education Ministers from all states. And also coming to the appointment of TNCC President. <laughs> Have you expressed your willingness that you want to be there? I have. I have. As I told you, as you rightly said, it's only an appointed position. It is appointed at the will and pleasure of the Congress President. I have worked with the DMK and I understand the DMK. And I'm absolutely certain that I can manage the relationship with the DMK. We know our limits. Annamalai's Pada Yatra has crossed Sivaganga. Did you good, I hope he had good ch Chattinad food on the way because our place is known for good Chattinad food. Hello and welcome to the News Minute interviews. Today we are joined by Karthi Chidambaram, who is a Congress MP, someone who is very outspoken. And we have a lot of questions to ask him about uh, uh, the Congress party, the India Alliance and, uh, you know, his own experience of uh, uh, encountering uh, the central agencies. Uh, we are recording this interview in his office in Chennai which has been raided multiple times by multiple agencies. Uh, two agencies, eight times. Uh, two, agen two agencies, eight times. Uh, thank you so much for talking to us, sir. You have been a first-time MP for the past four and a half, five years. You're com completing five years. What has been your experience like being an MP in Modi's India? See, an MP really doesn't have much uh, powers. I mean, it's even though that's the highest uh, elected representative the people directly vote for, the MP really has no real powers. Most of the services which affect people are provided by the state government. So that authority is not there with MP. And in the central government schemes, there is really no role for the MP to be involved in the implementation of those schemes because they are implemented through with the state administration or by the bureaucracy. But people's expectations from the MP are very, very high because it's the highest elected representative they have. I don't blame the people for having this expectation because it's natural for them to have expectation. But without executive powers, the MP within the constituency typically encompasses one district or a little bit more than one. It really has no real writ. All we have is this five crores as MP lads, which we can recommend at our discretion. This is also not, uh, to doing small 
projects by uh, overriding the bureaucracy and overriding the red tape itself. And so we typically end up doing, you know, a bus shelter, a water tank, a bore well, or a community hall. These kind of small things is what we can do. So really, there is not much an MP, particularly an MP who is not part of the ruling alliance, in, who is not part of the ruling party in, in the state, or is not part of the government in centre, can actually do in the constituency. So we only, what we do is we are, we, we only do the interventionist politics. That is, we intervene as recommenders whenever something is not going well with the uh, with the administration and put pressure on them. And we can spend or rather recommend the spending of this five crores, which is actually not very much. Five crores might sound as a very large sum to your viewers, but it encompasses six assembly segments in Tamil Nadu. When you divide five crores among six assembly segments and a population of nearly 20 lakhs, it's really not much you can do in terms of project size. The typical project size is only between three to seven lakhs. So small projects in small communities can be done. And that is the only direct uh, benefit which we are uh, giving to the uh, people. As far as parliament is concerned, and I've always said two things. One is the skill sets one needs to win elections in a constituency and the skill sets one needs to be considered a good MP in the constituency are completely different from the skill sets you need to be a performer in parliament. Mm. To win an election, you need to manage the political environment. You need to be part of a political party, a political alliance and manage the local equations there to win an election. That is the skill sets you need. And then to be interacting with the local population in their festivities and in their uh, days of uh, distress as well. That is the kind of interaction which, which will make you a reasonably popular MP in the constituency. But the skill set you need in parliament, particularly if you are in opposition, is a skill set to intervene and debate very, very complicated laws, which I believe most MPs, including me, do not really have the skill set. We are not really prepared for it. And neither are we given the tools and the resources to, in order to, it would be effectively uh, educated about. I'll tell you. I'll so, bills you. are not given to you? Bills are given one night before the, it's being, see, this government does not give the bills well in advance. See, typically what should happen is a bill should be introduced in parliament and sent to the standing committee. Then standing committee will take about six months to study it because the whole parliament can't study it. I am a member of a standing committee. I enjoy my work in the standing committee. I completely enjoy my work in the standing committee. I am in the IT standing committee. I like the work there. Standing committees must be given greater importance. Standing committees must go through the bill in great detail and then send it back to parliament and then you should pull to vote. But this government does not, if you look at the stats, I don't have the ready number with me. Overwhelming number of bills are never sent to the standing committee. So they are passed in parliament. And in parliament they are passed because of the brute majority the government has. And we are given very little time to even study the bill. Even in the little time you study the bill, every MP, first of all you need to have command over the English language to even, in, in order to be uh, conversant to even to understand a bill. A bill is not a simple document or a, or a newspaper story. It's a very complicated document. First of all, most MPs do not have command over the English language. That's a, maybe a slight advantage I have and I'm able to participate a little bit more because of the, the, the the, the good fortune of having uh, an education in the English language, which, which most other MPs are, 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 are disadvantaged. By. And secondly, even complicated bills can't be understood by however conversant you are in English. You need to have real tools. At least, I mean, some of our MPs, we have legislative assistants who are trained in public policy who work with us. I am aided by an agency called PRS, PRS. which gives, gives me a lamp. I've been given a lamp every year. There are only 50 MPs in India who have been given lamps. I'm one of the MPs who have been given. So because of that, I'm able to, to, to at least be reasonably conversant in a bill. But most MPs don't have the tools. In fact, I have gone to the extent of saying that every MP, irrespective of being ruling, opposition or whatever, must be given two aids like what the PRS is offering by the government itself. That is how it works the rest of the world. If you go to America, the congressional aid is, is, a, is a paid employee to help the legislator to, power, to navigate the complexity of parliament. That's something that the government doesn't want. The government no, they doesn't can want easily do it. You can create where we are, what, 750 MPs, including Raj Sabha, 1,500 people of a good cadre can be easily created and irrespective of a permanent cadre and allow two of them to an MP. Without this, Without the command of the English language and without the aid of these two uh, very well-trained uh, public policy analysts, it is impossible to participate in a debate. So, for example, I get opportunities to participate because I have the tools to participate. 
all MPs, in my opinion, are very, very smart people, but they don't have the tools to participate in, in debates. And so debates are becoming meaningless. And because of the way we vote in our system, that the, you vote only according to party lines, no bill can be defeated. Every bill of the government will be passed. In fact, till date, I will tell you, I, I can, uh, I'll bet on this, not one single amendment ever proposed by anybody has ever been accepted by this government. If you ask the BJP members, they themselves, 90% of the time, will not know what they're voting for. They vote because the government has asked them to vote. There is no real serious introspection. So, what we are doing in parliament, we are only acting as a rubber stamp. See, in parliamentary parlance, it is always certain the government can have its way because it has its majority. But the opposition must have its say. Here, they don't want us to debate. They don't give us adequate time. They don't give us adequate resources to understand the bill. And then they, then they ask us to uh, participate in debates. And sometimes because they don't agree to what topics we want to debate, it is all passed in a din. For example, the data protection bill is a yeah. seriously technical document. Hmm. A technical document. I have been part of the IT committees where we have seen various variants of the data, uh, data protection bill, but we have not seen the final version. It has been passed in the din. I mean, 99% um, of the members of parliament will not even... Uh, understand the bill if you give them to them they need they need serious assistance to even understand the bill but that is how our democracy is functioning today parliament has been uh, reduced to a rubber stamp it is almost like the chinese parliament where a thousand people are there when g comes in and says something everybody lifts their hands here you have 303 people of the bjp who lift their hand and majority wins and that's how it goes so we have the entire purpose of parliament where there has to be debate discussion and dissent and, uh, you know, and, and changing of minds. See, changing of minds never happens in Indian politics anymore. Nobody changes their mind. Everybody comes with a fixed notion of where they stand. Nobody ever listens to another person and says, yes, I've changed my mind. You have convinced me of it. That never happens in politics anymore. So it's, it is becoming a, a rubber stamp. In that way, my parliamentary experience in Delhi has been very, very disappointing for me. So what do you think has changed in the past 10 years in India after... Modi took over as uh, the Prime Minister because you are someone who observes politics very closely. You are from a political family. You have seen the UPA, the functioning of the UPA. And now you are seeing NDA government uh, for the past 10 years. What has changed? Uh, See, fundamentally, I always believe a coalition government in India is far more democratic than a single party government. Because we, since we don't have debates in parliament because of the majority situation, in a coalition government, parties have to agree before something is brought about. And even a single party is seriously dominant, like the way the BJP is, there is no debate. I mean, demonetization happened. The finance minister of the day did not know it. Most decisions are announced by the prime minister without the ministers even knowing it. The farmers' protest was uh, that the laws were withdrawn without the agriculture minister knowing it. There is no more cabinet system in India. It is a presidential form of government where the PMO runs the government country with diktats and everybody else endorses it because they are constitutionally mandated to endorse it. That is all is happening. We are really become, we are no more a parliamentary democracy in the true sense. We are no more a cabinet driven government in the true sense. We are a presidential government run from the PMO with this select band of officers. So what has, uh, you know, like you said, things have changed in the parliament, things have changed in the way how the government functions. What has changed in the BJP too? You see, the BJP, for whatever reasons I dislike the agenda and the ideology of the BJP, I must give it to them that they are a democratic party. Anybody can become the leader of the party. That goes through a very rigorous internal well, you, you may not necessarily mean a straightforward election, but a rigorous internal contest or a process by which somebody emerges in the top. And that I must uh, uh, give them that credit, be it uh, Vajpayee, then Advani, and now Modi, who really became the leaders of the party. Whether somebody else holds the position of the president, nobody ever believes that Mr. Nadda is the leader of the party. Everybody believes the leader of the party is Modi. But he came through a, a rigorous contest. But in the past, the BJP was a collective. Under Vajpayee and under Advani, Decisions were taken as a collective. A parliamentary board was there and that parliamentary board had senior members of the party who used to debate, discuss and then decide. That system has completely collapsed. Now it's become a completely a one-man show. Like most other regional parties function in this country where it's almost the, the regional party has got a normally a larger than life leader. And this has also become a BJP has also become now run by a larger than life leader who runs it, who is his diktats, and everybody else follows. There is no dissent, there is no disagreement with the leader in any way. Even I don't think there's any disagreement in private, and definitely, definitely no disagreement in public. But that was not the case under a Vajpayee or, or a Vadwan. That change has happened in the BJP, where it has shed his uh, its uh, internal democratic structures. 
that has definitely happened. So the BJP no more is a, while the present leader has come through a quote unquote democratic process, now everything else is a dictator driven process in the BJP and not a democratic process. So you interact with a lot of BJP MPs or union ministers. In private, do they complain about the internal functioning? Uh, they are. They make this. Some, very of them, scared? some of them, uh, I have good relationships with some of them. I obviously can't name them. Uh, but uh, they do lament about the the style and the, the tenor in which the BJP is going. It is no more a, a participative collective than it used to be. Uh, it, it is a very personality driven thing. And and more and more people are in, in, in the BJP are also becoming fanboys like they are in, with the regional party larger than life leaders i mean that was not the case with the bjp they are becoming fanboys of the prime minister so it's almost like uh, you know you know when he cocks into the uh, parliament they are all thumping the desks as if some gladiator is walking into the into the colosseum and you know every time uh, chanting his name whenever uh, he wants to say so that, that, that those kind of uh, practices were not there uh, in the past in the BJP. BJP was a far more, uh, you know, it at least appeared to be a far more of a collective. That's definitely gone. But uh, having said that, uh, the opposition was also powerful at some point in time, holding the government to account. But in the last nine years, we have not seen uh, uh, the opposition stepping up. See, and unfortunately, like, you know, the the, unfortunately, the gearing has become like that. Whereas the government, a single party has got absolute majority after a long time. And they are behaving that they have the complete mandate and don't need to. There is no more cross dialogue with the opposition. There is no more briefing of the opposition and saying, bringing, winning them over or asking for their suggestions. As I told you, you know, if this is really a proper functioning democracy, they should have accepted some of the amendments we suggest in technical bills, even in technical bills, leave alone the political bills. In technical bills, they do not even uh, take the suggestions we, we give. There is no cross, uh, cr has the prime minister in his numerous trips going abroad. Has he taken any opposition MPs along with him? In his, in his, as the president of India, in their numerous trips, are they taking some opposition MPs along with him? Now this G20 is happening. Have they even involving some of the opposition members in, in the events which are happening with other countries? There is no coming together at all. And because they have this brute majority, they simply think they have, they have won the mandate. How parliament must endorse whatever we do. We have the mandate to do what we want. And that is their attitude in which they are going. But politically speaking, uh, the role of the opposition has also been very disappointing. It has been very dismal. The opposition, uh, you know, it's so divided. And that was one of the reasons why, uh, you know, the government was... See, within uh, parliament, I mean, we might, I might disagree with some of the, the strategies we deploy there. But the consensus in the parliament is whenever we ask for an adjournment motion, the parliament, the, the speaker doesn't allow it. He's never allowed an adjournment motion. Since he does not allow an adjournment motion or the topic we want to discuss, we are not participating in most of the debates. So we are, so it's a catch-22 situation. No? We are not participating because we don't know, they are not allowing us to this. And it's convenient for them to allow us to, to disrupt and pass bills in the din without uh, uh, without answering our questions. But they are not magnanimous. You know, if I was with 303 seats, I wouldn't, but my, my assessment is that there is a grave inferiority complex for the BJP, in spite of the fact that they have this great majority. They are afraid to let the opposition speak. So what if we speak? You can vote us out. Even if we bring in a topic on an adjournment motion, if I had 303 MPs on my side, I would allow the opposition to say whatever it wants to say. I would put it to vote and defeat it in the floor of the house. Here they don't want us to even speak. See, that is where the gridlock happens. There is no large heartedness there because I think it stems from a grave sense of inferiority complex that the BJP has. I don't know why. Why it should BJP or Modi? The BJP, when I say they're not allowing or listening to another point of view, I mean, you can easily listen to the other point of view and, and vote it down. But this is parliament. I'm saying even in public sphere, the opposition has not been uh, able to, you know, capture the imagination of the I, people I, by raising issues or holding are, this government. See, the to point account. is, there is no united opposition because it's quite a complicated exercise to unite the opposition because there are competing interests in each state. Particularly, regional parties will not like to have a relationship with an organization with which it's competing in that state. So it's, it's a little complicated to put together a pan-India alliance, which is in part. But we are raising issues. But the point is, today institutional capture has happened and media capture has also happened. Where where do we get the space? Where do we get the space to even counter uh, what, uh, what the government puts out? I mean, the Prime Minister speaks for two hours 
I mean, is there is there an invitation from the from the media for the, for a prominent opposition leader to come and even speak for 30 minutes countering the prime minister's two hour speech at the Red Fort? No. So the point is, we are not given space, and we are fighting for that space, and we are trying to raise issues. But I must confess that the Hindi heartland of India is completely enamored and captivated by this Hindutva agenda. The Hindi Hindutva agenda in the Hindi heartland is working. And a significant number of people are buying into that poisonous, bigotry-driven agenda. And that is what is solidifying the BJP's base. And in order to counter that, I am afraid we have not yet come up with a counter-narrative in the Hindi heartland. In the states we have, for example, in Tamil Nadu, in Kerala, in Bengal, there are counter-narratives. That's why the BJP is getting defeated. But in the Hindi heartland, there is no counter-narrative to this Hindi-Hindutva agenda, which they are giving as a national agenda. That is why the BJP has setbacks at the state level in, the, in those regions. But when it comes to the national level, this Hindi-Hindutva agenda overrides all other concerns and they are, they are catapulted to the no, That's clearly a failure of the opposition. If the opposition... I agree. I agree. We have not yet, I completely agree with the not yet, that we have not, like in Tamil Nadu, where we have a self-respect uh, self movement, uh, a pushback against the, uh, the, the, the very divisive Hindutva agenda uh, and, 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 and the Hindi uh, thrust on us. We don't have a counter-narrative in the Hindi-speaking heart and particularly in, in the state of Uttar Pradesh. See, Uttar Pradesh, whether we like it or not, accounts for 80 seats in parliament. Once it's got 80 seats in parliament, it's like running a race where you are standing 10 meters behind the uh, opponent who's got such a head start in parliament. We are not able to come up with a counter narrative in those states. I completely agree with that. But being a, a, a non Hindi speaking South Indian politician, I'm also not able to imagine what we should be saying or what is, I don't really have a concrete idea. So, you know, while I might say that we don't have it, I'm not some sort of an oracle here who's got a solution for that problem. In fact, uh, all of us are still struggling, and, but the solution must come from the political forces there. I mean, uh, to the counter this Hindi Hindu. So, had, like we have done it in Tamil Nadu. Yeah, have you interacted with the political forces or your friends in uh, yeah, we, parties we, in we, North Of course, India. we keep what, talking. What everybody talks about it, but everybody also acknowledges the fact of this, this great strides and great penetration the Hindi Hindutva agenda has had in the Hindi heartland. Like never before. Never. See, the reason I'll tell you, you see, there's a crucial difference between the Congress and the BJP. The BJP is aided by a lot of satellite organizations outside the political firmament. For example, the RSS, the, VG, the VHP, the Bajrangal, the Ram Sena, or whatever you might call it. These, are, these organizations' only agenda is to promote and propagate the Hindutva, the two are very far muscular Hindutva nationalism in these places. So the BJP gets the benefit from these organizations which are constantly interacting or meddling into daily affairs, stoking fear, stoking passions and consolidating their support base. And that support base automatically translates into a BJP vote bank when it comes to an election. Because if you, you are agreeing to the agenda and the campaign of these organizations, you will automatically gravitate towards the BJP. You can't be a Bajrangal supporter and say you'll vote for the Congress. You can't agree with the VHP and say I'll vote for the Congress. It doesn't work. Whereas we are completely handicapped. We don't have a single organization outside our political firmament. Every organization we have or every subsect we have is within the party. We don't have any uh, Nehru youth clubs. We don't have any uh, Indira Gandhi volunteer uh, women forces. We don't have any of those things. We don't have anything outside the party structure. And everybody is within the party structure. And once you're within the party structure, your conversation with the people is always vote for me. See, in my opinion, your, your conversation with somebody cannot be the first line cannot be vote for me. You need to interact with them socially. You need to, to, to become one with them socially uh, and, then, uh, and, and sort of uh, participate in their daily concerns and before you convert them into a voter. Whereas as a political party, when you don't have the social structures to penetrate, you, 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 are, you are actually ceding space for other forces to, to enter, which they have these organizations and that's have a distinct advantage. And these organizations, in my opinion, if you actually weigh the Congress and the BJP as political parties, the reason why we are not able to match them in the Hindi heartland is because of the support they get from these satellite organizations which work for them, whereas we do not have equivalent satellite organizations for us. So, which means that in 2024, the job of the opposition parties is going to be very no, difficult. No, I, you, I, it, is, yeah. it is an uphill task. See, it, see, if you look at state by state, I am absolutely certain that in Kerala and Tamil Nadu, the uh, India Alliance, 
will sweep the polls. I am absolutely certain that we are going to our performance in Karnataka is going to improve. But in the Hindi heartland is where my concern is. While what is the agenda we are propagating in order to win? Because that is almost a straight fight between the BJP and the Congress. There is no more aid and assistance from these uh, alliance partners. There are a lot of places there is no aid and assistance from the alliance partners. So how do we consolidate that? It's a complicated question and I honestly don't have the answer at the moment. But it is very worrying that this Hindi Hindutva agenda has taken such a deep root socially within the people of, of, of the Hindi heartland of India. So what exactly that BJP wants to do if they come back for another term? No, their, their agenda is, see, their agenda, their agenda is very clear. They want uniform civil code, they'll want to other the Muslims, they want to treat... See, their agenda is that India must be an Hindu Iran. I always say, you know, I mean, exactly like how the Ayatollahs run Iran, the BJP wants to run India on a Hindu version. They want to make India, Hindutva, Iran. That is their goal. Whether it is with the religious police, the moral police, uh, no dissent, uh, judiciary, uh, you know, interpreting the law according to their uh, uh, historic code. It, that is the, exactly what they want to do. In fact, they can pretend as much as they want to do. The, the BJP's version of vision for India, Bharat, whatever you might call it, is exactly what uh, the, the Ayatollahs have done to Iran. So the India Alliance will not be able to stop them. No, no, I'm like, not. I see uh, that is too premature to say. See, hmm. we, we see. But do you have a narrative? Do you have a plan in place to stop the BJP? <coughs> see, I am not. This is this is a question way beyond my pay grade. Mm -hmm. You have to understand very very clearly. I can confidently tell you the India Alliance is going to sweep Tamil Nadu. We will win all 39 seats in Tamil Nadu. I can confidently tell you that. Last time we won 38 out of 39 seats. This time we will win 39 out of 39 seats. Okay, South is clearly sorted. So I, but I what about the North? That's that, where that the is where I am trying to tell you that I am not. I'm, it's a question beyond my pay grade. I don't necessarily have the answers on either the tools. I don't have the the communication tools to to, to even to to, to 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 communicate a narrative. That is a that is a communication which has to happen from the native speakers of that place. You see, I always believe that elections are won and lost at the ground by by people communicating the ground. Here in Tamil Nadu, we are clearly able to articulate and communicate uh, the, against the poison of the BJP. We need to do that there. But how do you do it? What tools you deploy is something which only we, the call must be taken by the ground level leaders there and not, I mean, I don't really have the skill sets to do that. And, uh, you know, opposition has fa uh, you know faced considerable amount of onslaught in the past nine years. Going forward, ahead of elections, is there a concern that uh, the central agencies will be unleashed? Of course, that is, that is exactly what they will do. Today, I also read that uh, Abhishek Banerjee has been raided this morning. I mean, they will constantly go after political leaders uh, to, to, to overawe them, to, to, to make sure that they are immobilized and that they are caught up in this uh, legal rigmarole and uh, they are not able to concentrate on, on, on politicking. That is their strategy because there is complete institutional collapse. But what is sad is that the Guardians are not stepping in. I really I am disappointed that the courts are not stepping in to stop this kind of unbridled uh, exercise uh, and weaponization of the law. You see, please understand one thing. Whatever happened to the Jews in Germany was also legal. Because the German Reichstag passed laws telling the Jews must go and live somewhere. They must wear a Star of David in their hand. Their stores must be marked. Then they must be sent to the, uh, to the camps. It is all according to law. So, the BJP always conveniently also says, oh, every raid is happening because there is a judicial order. Every arrest has also got a remand order. So, the weaponization law has happened. And here, the umpire, the guardians, in my opinion, are not stepping in enough to make sure it's applied fairly and it is not being used unfair. But in your case, the courts had intervened. They had given but you when? quite a bit of a relief. But relief, but, but, but I'm still, see... If anybody wants to talk about my case, they must read the absurdity in the charge sheets. It's an absurd charge sheet. And I'm telling you that this case will drag on for a long, long time. But I have to deal with it. I have to deploy lawyers. I have to appear. I have to seek permission to travel abroad. This is the punishment. I know that I am going to get absolutely cleared by all these cases. But when? It's already been uh, from 2015. It's been eight years. It might take another 28 years. Who knows? Who knows? So, I mean, as uh, Narsimra jokingly said when Lakubai Patak, filed a case against him. He said, petitioner will die, uh, respondent will die, judge will die, uh, lawyer will die, but case will go on forever. Okay. At a very personal level, what have these cases done to you as a politician, as a person? See, personally what it has done to me is that it's, it has uh, made people wary of doing business with me. Why would anybody want to do business with me? Because if the minute you do business with me, any transaction with me by this wide interpretation of the PMLA can be termed as a proceeds of crime. 
So tomorrow morning I buy something from you. Technically, they can say this money came from that proceeds of crime which I have gone to you, so they can raid you also. See, if you look I, at I, it, I hope interviews don't come under I, the I, under this. This is not a paid interview, so you know. You, 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 yeah, yeah, it is. It is not a paid interview. We should we should be fine. <laughs> so the point is, see, they have raided absurd people. They have they have, and you know they have raided my architect. They have raided my web designer. They have raided my personal assistant. See, it it it, it, it is it is it, it, it leads to so much. Fear that nobody wants to do transactions with you. Nobody wants to do business with you. So that what happens. And then, and because of because you are, are, are technically are under trial, you have to seek permission every time you want to travel. It is a fundamental right. So your rights are seriously curbed. Your ability to do business is curbed. Then you have these attachment proceedings, which the ED does left, right, and centre. That's absolutely no meaning. So your assets are blocked. I mean, they are not taken away, but you really can't transact in them. So it really disrupts your life. You know, I have the resources in terms of uh, of a legal background and, uh, and a good legal team. I'm doing. But uh, uh, anybody else would have folded up by now. Would have really folded up by now. I mean, there has been nobody in this country who has been raided eight times. For what? Can I mean actually the cost of those raids would have been greater than the false accusations they have made against me. And if you read the charges, you will understand the absurdity of the charges. Which will all collapse in due course, but whether it's going to collapse now or 20 years later, because in the way which we will navigate our legal system, I don't know. So why do you think that uh, the Chidambarams have come under so much scrutiny, so much scanner of the central agencies? See, like really, it looks like really the government wants to go after you. Yeah, see, the reason is because uh, my father is perhaps the most articulate and vehement speaker against the government and rights against the government and articulates this position very forcefully. And also the fact that the government wants to send a signal that somebody who comes from the background of Chidambaram, who obviously we come from a very uh, illustrious uh, background from my father's family and my mother's family, who is educated abroad, uh, who is considered to be quote unquote an intellectual. If we can humiliate him and bring him to his knees, we can do that to anybody else. It is a signal to everybody else. If we can bring this to a Chidambaram, who is Home Minister and Finance Minister and Commerce Minister of India, who has is, who is presented numerous budgets, who goes and speaks in international forums, who studied in Harvard, who comes from a storied family, we can humiliate him. We can humiliate anybody else. It is a signal. It is a signal to a whole class of people, a whole class of, say, upper middle class and upper class people, who perhaps have a liberal mindset and who articulate and write. If we can do to him, who perhaps is at the top of the pile, what are you all? It's a signal. That is what they want to do. So, you know, it's something uh, uh, that, that a lot of people have never seen. You know, CBI officers uh, or uh, central agency officers scaling up the walls of a... It's a like unnecessary NS. drama. Unnecessary uh, drama. So, like, you, 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 were, you were watching that. Like what was your... Uh, no, no, it's unnecessary. I, I told you, you know, these cases... Like, like how it has also, you know, disrupted your see, family. See, this, this, these are... First and foremost, people must understand, these cases do not require arrest or raids. These are technically cases based on files in the government and because of financial transactions. Which the records are all apparent, either in your tax records or in your filings or in the file notings. So you can technically call somebody, ask for explanations and file your charge. Sheet. All these raids and arrests are only for optics. And only for the voyeuristic pleasure of somebody else who is watching, who wants to send a signal. Otherwise, it, it aids in no way in an honest prosecution. In any case... So, I mean, what if there is an, some unaccounted transaction, unaccounted... If there is unac paper. See, it's, it's very simple. If you have an asset, you think that they can't account for how they purchased their asset. You look at the tax records. If you have a property worth 10 crores, which is the market value, and you have claimed you have bought it for only... Uh, you don't have 10 crores and you have bought the property, ask them to explain. If they are not able to explain how they had the money to buy it, File a uh, charge it. See all these raids. What have they? What have they? What are they unearthed in the raids? Except for saying the standard line, we have taken electronic devices and incriminating documents. It's a standard line they give. Please understand. Even an alarm clock is an electronic device. So what are these electronic devices? Is there a house without a mobile phone today? See, this is all merely only for optics. There is no investigational value in, in any of these raids or uh, or, uh, or arrests. You can easily, if you are really honest. And you want to prosecute somebody because you have evidence. It's all documentary. You could easily call for the files, ask for clarifications and file your charge sheet. There's nothing more to be done to it. So that is the reason why you don't have anything in office. No, no, you are searching for a prop. 
<laughs> to actually keep something See, in the point the is, they have taken away my computers thrice. So, I have stopped buying computers. Because it makes no purpose. I do not know when they are going to come back. Again, they will take away the computer. They will only wrap it up in a gunny bag and it will lie in some ED office somewhere. So, what is the purpose of even having a computer? It will be taken away every time. I have done it three times. And, and then every time we apply to the court to give it back, they will come and say, this is uh, evidence for this. Uh, I do not know evidence for what. So, it's evidence for something. So, we can't release it until the trial is over. By the time the trial is over, that computer would have been outdated. So, I would leave it at that. But one, one charge that the opposition makes time and again is that, uh, you know, the union government is using ED to poach uh, MPs, MLAs or to, you know, try and... Uh, you know, poach politicians from one side to another. What happened in your case? Were you pressurized to join no, the BJP? I, see, or, I think or like, or see, everybody any... knows what I stand for. I mean, I don't think any, I mean, the BJP will be most uncomfortable with a person like me. <laughs> and I will be most uncomfortable with BJP. With my liberal views and my globalist views. I consider myself a globalist and a liberal. I will never fit into their paradigm. So, so they never tried that. <laughs> I think they Or maybe be... like somebody must have said something to you. Like no, no, not that is always huh. thrown about all the time. You know, oh, all their troubles will end. I said there are no troubles, they're only invented troubles. So let me go through it. When I say I am a secular liberal globalist and there is no place better for me than the Congress party. So, what happens in the custodial interrogation? Nothing. Actually, then, nothing. Actually, I have you, been, you have been there several, several I have, times. I have, in fact, I have been saying that they must record it and live telecast it. They must live telecast <laughs> my interrogations. I have been asking for this. I even told the court, please live telecast. You will un understand the absurdity of these exercises. They don't. Rahul Gandhi also said the same thing. Please live telecast what you are asking me. I mean, we have both exchanged notes personally about what has happened because he was also... Like, like what? 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 Nothing, it just goes on. It's, it's absurd questions. You will start from where do you live to things. Obvious questions, nothing of significance. So, why did you travel to London? Yeah, no, something, I mean, not even, nothing even significant. So, in fact, if you live telecast those quote-unquote, as the television says, grilling, you will understand the absurdity of it. I've been asking for my live telecast, but they, I mean, till now, no court has agreed to it. But so, I that should be a like. great footage for a television. No, I, I want to. I, I, I want them to, in fact, there are some uh, in, uh, interrogations which have been recorded because of court order, but I, I want them to play it out. I really want them to play it out. It will, it will, it will, it will, it will end this, uh, this farce once and for all. Because the press notes will say something else. Oh, the press like notes are meaningless. You must actually put the live telecast. Actually, you must put the live telecast of my interrogation and Mr. Rahul Gandhi's interrogation by the ED, which they have recorded. And I wish they will one day play it out for the nation to see what they did for 12, 13 hours, 14 hours every day with us. So, what exactly happened? Nothing in happens. Interrogation? Like Literally, you, nothing uh, happens. How many questions will be asked? I mean, I, in my, my entire uh, time with the CBI of 11 days, mm. I would have uh, totally, uh, my entire questioning would have taken place for about four hours. Rest of the hour? I, I was just waiting. That's all. Nothing. Waiting else. where? Nothing. I was just there. I was waiting in the room. That's it. Nothing else. I so no interaction with nothing, anyone. Nothing. 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 You know, they take away phones, or, but I used to take books and I would read. That's all. I would. See, there's nothing. To, what is there to ask? If you ask me a question, uh, have you met this person? Once I say I, I have not met the person, unless you show me counter, contrary proof that I have met the person, you can't even ask me a second question. Correct. So most of the things when they say about anything, any of these allegations against me, I say I don't know the person. Then they have nothing to say that I know the person. They have nothing to show that I met the person. So, where is the question of a follow-up question? Then nothing can be asked, no? What can you ask me? If you ask me, do you, uh, uh, have you met Osama bin Laden? I'll say no. But then what, what is the second question can you ask me? Did you buy arms from him? You cannot ask me. I have never met him. So, you, unless you show me proof that I met Obama, you confront me, there's nothing. So, so, this is an absurd exercise. I am urging the citizens of India do not fall prey for these press notes and what comes there. Please understand, this is all optics. It's only done to create this myth of some sort of grave wrongdoing on part of the, of the opposition to paint them and to color them into something which they are not. But it has worked. People who have ED cases have joined the BJP. People who have CBI True. cases, corruption but cases, a, have joined the BJP. This is a very... So this, is is a, a, this has the, worked for them. This is, this is a very, very, very rough way of wooing somebody. Maybe it has, you know. They used to rave and rant against Ajit Pawar. Yeah. Exactly. And today he crosses over. They say, we, are, we have been waiting for you to come over and you have come to the right place. So, but that also, if this... If, the, if this uh, And he is also the finance minister. Uh, and possibly the chief minister very soon. That's okay. what I am told. No, I am very... very I'm, so I am told that he's going to be my chief minister. So, if this is going to be the politics and the people are not going to punish those who are doing this point, what can I say? So, what will the India Alliance do? No, no. The India Alliance is strong. It is strong in definitely in certain states. It is strong in Tamil Nadu. It is strong in Bihar. It will be strong in, 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 in Bengal. 
it could be potentially strong in delhi and in uh, punjab but there is a lot of give and take this is still more time so another there are a lot of issues with for example 100% there are 100% there are 100% there will be issues if all political parties have only one view and one view point we'll all might as well merge into one party you know we will have opposing views we will have competing interests so what has brought all these parties together i think their realization has come that india has gone into a very slippery slope with this totally dictatorial style of functioning of the bjp under this dispensation and this needs to be stopped so we need to sink in some of our common differences and come on to a common platform and fight these forces and that requires a lot of give and take and it requires a lot of maturity it's not an easy task i agree it's not an easy task it's easy in tamil nadu it's easy in uh, in uh, in uh, bihar it is not so easy in delhi and punjab it might not be so easy in bengal but with maturity we can come to some sort of an understanding but the prime minister says that he is going to return for the third time and he is going See, to i have never met a candidate in my election who believes he is going to lose an election even the independent candidate who files an election nomination will say i am going to win so i mean optimism is it is it is right he is prime minister he should be he is, he is right to be optimistic about it and it is our it is our right to put up a counter narrative and to put up a good fight and to see whether the people believe us or him when we go to the election but there is also a talk in delhi that uh, yogi is also being propped up <laughs> like is there something that no, you are you you foresee that the point is, the point uh, what the transformation of the bjp is very clear hmm. vajpay was considered to be fairly liberal was was replaced by advani who was more hawkish advani was replaced by modi who is even more hawkish so i will not be surprised if the bjp goes even more hawkish because i, I told you their goal is to become hindutva iran so if you want to become hindutva iran you need ayatullahs if you want an ayatullah you need these uh, self appointed swami ji's guru ji's uh, to come there so this is the trans this is the this is the path in which they will go i am not surprised in the path they are going but i do not see uh, anything happening in the, in the short run but eventually it might happen but that, that is the progressive path the bjp is going it wants an hindutva iran there is also this apprehension that like you spoke about ajit pawar ajit pawar has gone to the other side what about sharad pawar is there oh, a concern he, he, that he is playing a double game a very or? senior politician it will be very unfair for me to be commenting about him and he is i can only go by his public pronouncements and i can also only go by how his mps are in parliament particularly uh, led by supriya sore they seem to be very committed to the india alliance but what their internal dynamics is what is going to happen to their party what is happening to their vote bank i am not able to comment on it but i will take mr sharad pawar and supriya sule's words at face value that they are committed to remain in the india alliance okay coming to tamil nadu there are key issues here in tamil nadu neat you have a different take on neat no i really don't i have an evolving take on neat that's the point you see uh, i i am never afraid to change my mind i am never afraid to look into an issue and see how perspectives change the point oh, is your your earlier stand on neat is uh, you were you were uh, hear, hear, hear me out hear me out see the debate should be fundamentally how should we admit students into medical colleges should we have entrance exams or should we just go by the 12th standard marks tamil nadu in the past had a hybrid system where it, when i was in school my when my friends joined medical college there was a entrance exam in which 50% marks were uh, given weightage and 150 marks came from maths physics chemistry and then the tamil nadu government did away with it then the congress government proposed this central exam but gave the option for the states to opt in or opt out please let us be very very clear congress government did not make it compulsory to then neat was introduced and then initially it looked like a good entrance platform to allow people to join medical colleges but my position has evolved after looking at data and and talking to a, a huge number of people first and foremost i believe that this is anti federal that is my primary objection to this exam administered by a central agency when a state government is running the so this is anti federal so that and on that count i don't think it should be there you cannot have an central exam for state government run institutions where the entire appointing authority entire faculty entire funding is by the state government even though there is a central quota you can only restrict yourself to the central quota the state government quota grant but after talking to a wide section of people three four things are very clear to me about neat and why it's unfair to tamil nadu now initially the entire curriculum was based on the cbsc uh, system so that disadvantaged the uh, the higher the higher secondary the and the state state, uh, state state board school but then tamil nadu government i think in the previous admk regime to equalize the, the the state board curriculum with the uh, 
the uh, seven point five. They then they equalize the curriculum yeah. also. Then they gave the seven point five reservation. But what is coming out through the evidence is that even the people who are getting into NEET are people who are going to coaching classes. Without going to a coaching class, if you actually look at the stats, the number of people getting into medical college is very, very small. And what is also happening is that people take a year off to prepare for NEET and then they are getting in. And many, many of them are repeat takers of the NEET before they get in. So what is really happening is it has is, it is disrupted the educational cycle. You finish school in one year, you are not going to college the next year, you are practically preparing for an exam for one year, sometimes even two years and then going there. And it is also reaching out a situation in which you think your school exam is irrelevant now. You have almost, if you want to be a doctor, your school exam is irrelevant. That is not very welcome. You know, you can't have an entire educational system where you say my marks in that education system will have no bearing, none whatsoever to how I go to college and only this entrance exam. On that ground also, I think NEET is unfair. So NEET, if I, if the way it is structured today, it is definitely, you know, in, in definitely there is a bias to people going towards co coaching centers. The bias between CBSE and the state board might have been equalized a little bit. I'm not too sure how the curriculum is. But it definitely seems to have a bias against uh, English and versus the uh, person who's studying in a, in a vernacular language because the question paper translation apparently is not as seamless. And so this person who's studying school for 12 years is completely disregarded of his performance in that exam and is only evaluated another exam. But one must also understand that in the previous system, before we had NEET and before we had the 7.5 percentage examination, I mean, we only relied on 12 standard marks. The government school percentage into medical colleges also is very, very small. In fact, the real change and revolution, you must give credit where the credit is due, is for the ADMK government bringing this 7.5 percent, which this government is also continuing and have extended it to uh, med, uh, engineering colleges also, which is very good. I think you must increase it to 10 percent and even include aided schools because the aided schools are no really different from government No, the schools. DMK had promised that they will be giving 2.5 no, no, percent reservation 2.5 percent to the aided. government aided schools also must be given. That I think is a great social reformation. But I am now, my position is whether you should have an entrance exam solely for medical college is a call which the academics might take. But even if whatever the entrance exam is, there is no question of the central government conducting that exam. It must be a state government conducted exam. And even if the state government is conducting the exam, to disregard your 12 standard marks completely, it will also unfair because you go through an entire system. So either you go back to a hybrid system where a state government conducts the exam and you know takes the, uh, the 12 standard mark or you do away with an entrance exam itself because the entrance exam is definitely disadvantaging people who cannot afford going to a coaching center. And there's multiple people, multiple attempts which are going, which was not there when you were only doing a 12th standard exam. That was your cutoff mark. You either got into medical college that year and moved on. Now this has disrupted that cycle because now there is a, uh, you are not only, not only this fresh intake is competing for the seat, in the previous couple of intakes. So there are, in fact, you have, you have the pool of people participating in that competition for those 10,000, we only have 10,000 or 11,000 seats, is, is getting bigger and bigger, which is making the competition even more fierce. So on a, on a multiple levels, this has disrupted and in my opinion, uh, the equilibrium has gone. But it, the only good thing it has brought about, or it is forced to brought about, is this reservation for government schools, which I think should continue irrespective of what system we follow going forward. But has this uh, discussion come up in your party internal circles no, or not really, internal not, discussions. Not really. Nobody, oh. no, nobody has really had an... Why, why, why is that not See, happening? No, no, because nobody. here, DMK, their position is consistent. They have been opposing need yeah. I on think, several I, fronts. Yeah, I, I, think, they, I think they're right. You also they, agree. Yeah, they, it's definitely anti-federal. It definitely uh, disadvantages uh, uh, students who can't go to uh, uh, private coaching. It definitely disadvantages uh, the people who study in government uh, mediums, uh, Tamil medium schools or vernacular language schools. And it is also increasing the pool of people competing for the same right. number of seats. That's something which nobody ever pays attention to. Before, only those boys who finished the 12th standard exam or boys and girls were that competing. That one batch. batch. Now, this is multiple batches. Multiple are batches. Every year, the multiple batches are competing. That has become the, the stress of competition has even become more. So, these are reasons why I think that NEET as as it stands today, has no role in Tamil Nadu. But we need to build a national consensus. And I think the Chief Minister made a good attempt in writing to the Chief Ministers first. I think the next step, in my opinion, should be the Chief Minister must call for a meeting of Chief Ministers or Education Ministers from all states, particularly the non-BJP states, to come to Chennai, have a conference and put together a, a much more stronger, united statement. Not just the Tamil Nadu government statement, but a united statement on the ground that this is anti-federal. 
see, while some states might like the fact that there is a common entrance exam, please let us understand this is completely anti-federal. And this has been the, the style and tenor of the BJP in everything they do. Everything they do is taking away rights of the states, centralizing it. No, what, what, what they are trying is essentially they are, they are bringing this conversation of a merit. No, no, but how do you say that Wilson and Mark is not because the Because the governor says that no, the no, students should not have intellectual disability. No, no. And if, if he had the powers, he says no, no, never, ever. This governor has been the most controversial, unconstitutional governor I've ever seen in my life. In my position, his position is untenable. And the president of India must withdraw, immediately withdraw her pleasure and recall him immediately. He has no business saying what he says. He has crossed all proprietary and constitutional norms in his, in his public pronouncements. He is he's acting like a colonial governor. He is not acting like a constitutional functionary within the Indian constitution. And I believe that you know, he was a troublemaker in the past. In, 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 he came to Tamil Nadu as a punishment posting because of the mess he created in Nagaland, in the talks he had with the Nagas, and he came to Tamil Nadu. And you know, he is only a troublemaker here, and the president must withdraw her pleasure and withdraw him immediately. Talking about NEET, the DMK's uh, stand is very clear. But what about the Congress at no, the no, Congress level here in Tamil Nadu and other political parties? The Congress okay. here supports the DMK okay. in, in, for these following reasons, that it's anti-federal and it is, it is disadvantaged. The, the, the Tamil Nadu should be out of the NEET thing. But whether other Congress states or other Congress chief ministers are there, for example, in Karnataka or in, or in Rajasthan, I do not know what their position. There doesn't seem to be a pushback against NEET as much as we are having. But, but the there's no study that is conducted <coughs> in other no. states. Other states like, will the, the Congress High Command push for a study? Will the Congress I High think Command so. I, I, think, I, I think the point is that we must attack this fundamentally on, the, on, on it being anti-federal. That is the and that is how you must build a national consensus. And I urge the Chief Minister of Tamil Nadu to call for a meeting of all Chief Ministers, like-minded Chief Ministers, or at least Education Ministers, uh, Medical Education Ministers in, in Tamil Nadu and, and pass a resolution. In my opinion, that will have a far more greater pressure point than only Tamil Nadu speaking. If we can get other states also behind uh, our plea, I think there will be a far more greater weightage. Okay. And also coming to the appointment of TNCC President. Have you expressed your willingness that you want to be there? I have. I have. As I told you, as you rightly said, it's only an appointed position. It is appointed at the will and pleasure of the Congress President. And the Congress President, uh, in consultation with the, uh, uh, with, with the leadership in Delhi, will, will, uh, will uh, make this announcement. Yes, I have expressed my, uh, my willingness to take on this responsibility. I have expressed my keen interest in this responsibility. I know this is not the style in which politicians normally function in Tamil Nadu. Because Tamil Nadu, it's always, they will say, oh, I'm not seeking it. If they give it to me, I will take it. I'm, I've openly told everybody that, yes, I want this responsibility. I think I can do a good job. I have the energy. I have the enthusiasm. And I have the ideas to take this power, the Congress party forward for the next three years, if you give me this opportunity. But I completely understand that they have to weigh in multiple factors before making an appointment. I'm not saying that I have an ironclad case over everybody else. I'm sure there are there are other reasons why I might fit the bill and there are reasons why I might not fit the bill and there are reasons why... So what are the reasons you think that I, you might not fit the bill? I don't know. You see, I, 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 I am I'm a little bit of an out-of-the-box thinker. You know, so, so to, to, to give me the responsibility, it will, be, it will not be a status quo decision. It depends on what the leadership wants the party to do here. Here, it will be a little bit of out of the box. And if they want that, I, but I've, I've also told them what my strengths are. I've told them what I can do. But I'm sure others have also articulated their positions also. It's not as if that I'm the only one, maybe I'm the only one publicly saying that I've, I, I would like the opportunity. But I know there are a few others also who have evinced a very keen interest. And I'm sure they will weigh everybody and they will come up with a decision or they might uh, also come up with a decision. Of, uh, of continuing with the present arrangement until the parliament election is over. So, this is not something, this is not a... Uh, no, one of, one of the concerns that I hear from talking to people and leaders is that uh, they need someone who can manage the DMK, who can have a cordial relationship with the DMK. So, they are very scared that if you, if you bring a new person... I think this is a very, uh, in my opinion, a, a very unfair uh, comment on me. I have been with the DMK since 1996, from the Tamil Manila Congress, Congress days. The people who have not been in Tamil Manila Congress are the ones who have had relationship with the DADMK. I have never faced an election or I have never worked in an election with the ADMK. In fact, I am the one who has got a better relationship and an interpersonal relationship, right from the Chief Minister to, their, uh, to, to many of their MPs on a personal level. Just because I have opinions 
does not mean that there is a fissure in the things. I mean, does the, are they suggesting that the Congress party must not have an opinion on anything? And let me be very clear. Just because we are an alliance, we don't have to be in alignment on all issues. How can we align on all issues? We don't align on the uh, release of Rajiv Gandhi killers. I mean, is the Congress party saying that, uh, that uh, accepting that? So there will be a difference. But the point is, mutual respect is definitely there. I have worked with the DMK and I understand the DMK. And I'm absolutely certain that I can manage the relationship with the DMK. We know our limits. We are, I will never be over ambitious. I know the level of the Congress is today. I know what our immediate goals are. And I will ensure that the party's interests are, are placed much before any other interest. So that is very clear. No, but said that's, that's not there uh, from the Congress High Command. Because if the BJP wants to have a new president here, they have sent a, a, an ex-IPS officer who is relatively new to politics. They have given him that post and uh, he is trying to do whatever he, he does. But I'm saying like that's the risk that the Congress is unwilling to take. And I, that's, I am not, I, am not, I, can't, I can't speak for the Congress president or I cannot speak for the CWC. Right? That is again beyond my pay grade. As I have told you, I have evidence and interest. And I'm, I'm sure others have also evidence and interest. I'm sure there are reasons why I might fit the bill. There might also be reasons why I might not fit the bill. That is a subjective call they must take. Once they take the call, we will, we will see the next steps. I mean, it's not as if this is, this is not the end of the road. There is an election to be fought in 24. We will, we will cross the bridge as we go along. But, but I believe that I will do justice to the party. I believe I will invigorate the party. I believe I will bring in fresh energy to the party. I completely believe that. I mean, I am not shying away from it. This is a job I really would like to do. I mean, I, and, and, and I think I have the tools and the skill sets to do the job. And uh, talking about Sivaganga, uh, Annamalai's Pada Yatra has crossed Sivaganga. Did you good, I hope it? he had good chattinad food on the way because our place is known for good chattinad food. I do not know where he ate because typically I don't know. Typically these BJP chaps don't take them to, to establishments to serve non-veg. I hope they made an exception and this time when they came to chattinad they, they took him to a good mess which served some good chattinad food. I hope the next time he comes, I'll recommend a few places where he can have some good chattinad food. But what do you have to say about his Padi Yatra? No, no, the Padi Yatra is really having no impact. I mean, it's uh, I've checked a number of times uh, with a number of people. Uh, there is no resonance to the BJP in Tamil Nadu. The BJP is a shunned party, will be a shunned party, will be a rejected party. And the brand of uh, Hindutva, which they are trying to inject into Tamil Nadu, which is a tremendously temple-going, God-fearing state, will reject the BJP in 2024 as they have rejected in the past. Right, Mr. Kathi Chandramaram, thank, thank you so much for talking to us. Pleasure thank interacting with you. Thank you. Thank you.